Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here this afternoon, and thanks to all our incredible staff members who have been working day and night caring for our community, especially over this past holiday weekend. For the past several weeks, um, as you know, we've been following our COVID numbers, and they've been going through the roof, and we've been setting records that we don't want to set. Uh, before this current surge, our highest number of inpatients was 372, and just a few weeks ago, we almost doubled that. But now I'm feeling cautiously optimistic because our numbers over the past week have continued to go down with the exception of one day. As of this morning, we have 525 patients with COVID in our hospitals. Uh, and that's the fewest number we've had since August 13th. Uh, we had um, a number of admissions yesterday, but that number was down to 40. So we had 40 COVID admissions yesterday and 50 discharges. So this is the fourth time we've had more discharges than admissions since Thursday. So I really hope that we're seeing a downward trend in these cases. While this is promising news, we're still not out of the woods yet. We're still facing significant capacity issues. Our hospitals are at 97% capacity, as are our ICUs. And at Golisano Children's Hospital, we have 15 children in the hospital with uh, COVID, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we've lost 995 patients to COVID. And as we approach that milestone of 1,000, that unfortunate milestone, I, I wanted to just take a moment of silence for those families and for those patients that we lost. Thank you. Um, yesterday, in fact, we've lost 13 patients to COVID, uh, which is one of the highest totals we've seen. As I mentioned, we're at 97% capacity. We have a surge plan in place that is active. Uh, we've limited elective surgery. We've, we've opened command centers at each of our hospitals and at the Coconut Point Center. We've hired more than 150 nurses over the past several months, and we're limiting visitation. We're also taking some adult patients into Golisano to, uh, to offload some of the uh, space concerns we have in our, at our adult hospitals. In addition, uh, we opened our sedation unit here at Golisano. Now, the sedation unit is a place where children who need testing like MRIs who have to be still for quite an amount of time and can't do that because they might be very young and don't understand it, we actually sedate them. Uh, but we've taken that unit now and converted it to a patient care area so we can put some children in there and our sedation cases are now limited to stat or emergency cases and we're working with families to make sure that that the children are taken care of and the ones who need um, studies are being done so as as you know the number of cases are going down and as we see that continue we have to maintain our vigilance continue to do the things we've been doing all along that we've been preaching the social distancing the mask wearing the hand washing etc and if we do that we hope that we will see this this trend continue to go down so with that i'm going to introduce uh, dr stephanie stovall who will uh, provide some information on vaccination and some other topics dr stovall Thank you, Dr. Antonucci, and thank you all for coming today. Thanks for spending this time with us every week. I kind of feel like it's a fireside chat every week. Um, <clears throat> so you've probably noticed that um, every week I try to highlight a group. Um, last week we talked about pregnant women. Today I want to talk about kids a little bit. Um, as Dr. Antonucci mentioned, we're still not out of the woods for any of our populations, and in particular we are seeing um, rising numbers of kids who are in our facilities who are sick with COVID. Um, the one thing that we know is that vaccination works. Um, that's been proven over and over again. And we've had many of you who have responded to our pleas to go get vaccinated. We've vaccinated thousands of people Adult in the last eight months. ICU transfer, Health Park, Road 5708. Sorry. <laughs> Adult Met ICU transfer at Health Park, Road 5708. That is an adult med ICU transfer at Health Park, room 57085 West, 5th floor. Thank you. Um, so anyway, we've done thousands of vaccinations over the last several months. Many of you have brought your kids to be vaccinated. Many of you yourselves have gone to be vaccinated and it does make a difference. There have been a couple of recent studies that I wanted to highlight that have come out that show just how important vaccinations, vaccination is to our most vulnerable population. Um, in the last week, we've learned that vaccination not only works for adults, but it works for kids. There was a study where they looked at 12 to 17 year old 
um, patients who were um, vaccinated and unvaccinated. They compared the two groups and they found that if you were unvaccinated, those 12 to 17 year old healthy kids had a 10% higher risk of hospitalization in the month of August. There was another study that looked at lower vaccination rate states versus higher vaccination rate states. And in children 17 years and younger, if you lived in a lower vaccination rate state, you had up to four, per, or four times higher likelihood to visit an emergency department or to be hospitalized because of COVID. So the decisions that we make as adults, both to vaccinate our kids <clears throat> who are eligible 12 and over and to vaccinate ourselves, have a huge impact on the health of our children. So um, today, Tammy Anderson, one of our um, nurses in the intensive care unit here, is going to share with you some of her um, experiences and some of the things that she would like to get across um, to protect our kids. Hi, I'm Tammy Anderson from the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. I've been a nurse for about 38 years, and I've certainly seen a lot of things come along the scene. I remember being around before AIDS showed up, and I remember the terror that came around with H1N1. So I'm kind of no stranger to some of the things that happen. Um, but looking back over my career, that was kind of dress rehearsal. This has been the main event, and it's a brutal one. I don't know that I've ever seen a virus that is more indiscriminate, that it is more unpredictable, or that is more brutal than COVID-19 has been in our children. And this is kind of a new thing for us because we're seeing children from as young as a week or two of age all the way up to 17 and 18 years old of age coming into our intensive care unit very, very ill with conditions that we don't usually see in children, like blood clots in their lungs, um, like 15 and 16 year old healthy children, male and female, coming into the ICU, not even strong enough to be able to walk into their own beds. They can't breathe, they can't move, they can't get up. And I don't know how to describe to you what the emotions are of a mother and a father that comes in with their child when they're that sick. These are our kids. They can't breathe. The terror that these parents feel as they watch our children coming into this unit, they're afraid. They don't know what to expect. They're in disbelief and they're alone with their child. We do the best we can to support them because we don't treat just the child, we treat the family true too. We do the best we can to take care of the entire family. So if I had any advice to you right now, it would be to protect yourself and to protect your children. This virus is not something that you want visiting your home, you don't want visiting your children, and you absolutely don't want to have to come and visit me. Although I will do everything I can for you if you walk through our doors. This virus is no joke, and, and I think if we all continue to come together and do the smart things that Dr. Stovall that Dr. Antonucci have talked about. If we take care of the simple things like washing our hands and maybe this just isn't the time for the big birthday celebration where we have everybody together. Maybe this is time for this virus to settle down. We have 18 kids, um, several of them fighting for their lives in our um, children's hospital right now. That's more than we've ever seen. And these kids are sick. Um, so you can help us out because we're tired. We're tired. Thanks. Great job, Tim. Thank you. We happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, so I know that the number of discharges is going up, and obviously the number of admissions is going down, which is some good news. Um, where is the hospital standing as far as their surge plan, um, and what are the capacity concerns moving forward if there are still any? Well, uh, as you remember a few days ago, we were at 100% capacity. Now we're at 97. Um, so we, do, you know, we have some capacity, and our surgery plan is basically where it was with the limitation in elective surgery um, and doing some of the things like opening up some pediatric beds for adult patients, et cetera. So we're doing the same things that we were doing last week, and we're just watching on a day-by-day -day basis. It's important to remember that the uh, 
the number of admissions, COVID admissions, is what's really decreasing dramatically. If you remember, we were in the 80 to 100 range a day, and yesterday we were at 40. So if we can keep that trend, the discharges will continue to go. Unfortunately, as we're seeing sicker and sicker patients and more patients in our ICUs, uh, I'm, I would not be surprised to see the deaths continue to be in the double digits for the next uh, few days. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't recall who it was. Maybe Dr. Stovall talked about vaccinating more folks over the last several months. How many have you all vaccinated recently, either the last week or over the last month? Do you know those numbers? So every week we have a schedule and then we also have walk-ins. Um, I believe the last couple of weeks we've been near a thousand for our vaccines given. Um, as of today, I think we had um, between 300 and 400 who were scheduled for this week and our clinics occur on Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Fridays from seven to 3.30. Um, so having not really even started the day yet, we had 350 or so on the books for this week. Week. for this week yeah and that doesn't count any of the walk-ins and does that number do you know has it increased over the last several weeks every week do you tend to see more folks than the previous coming to get a shot yes it has in fact um, just in the last couple of weeks we had to add a third day to our vaccination schedule so that we could accommodate everyone um, we also have multiple other sites that are giving giving the vaccine as well but that's the easiest walk-in site for our own um, for people who work within our system who still need to be vaccinated. Um, those folks can even go to employee health. So that's at all of our sites. And then some of our um, primary care offices are also giving the vaccine. And understanding your role, I know you are not out at the clinic administering vaccines, but between the three of you, I wonder, do you hear from your staff, um, maybe the reasoning some of those folks are coming in now so late after its availability? Do you know the main driving force for the folks coming to get a shot? What I've heard from some people, um, having been in our hospitals the last couple of weekends on call, people who have chosen to get vaccinated recently are doing so because of the Delta variant and because of the increased numbers. Um, many of them may have been infected in the past and they're starting to wonder if they truly have that natural immunity. Um, and they're listening to the information that's coming out that says that you still need to be vaccinated even if you've been infected in the past. With the Labor Day holiday weekend and a lot of people out and about, maybe going to sporting events or in big groups, are there any possible concerns that you could see more admissions later this week um, or of infection? I don't think you could um, not be concerned after seeing a lot of things that went on this weekend, certainly watching some of the football games with 80 or 90,000 people packed into a stadium. So yeah, I think the next seven to 10 days are gonna be very telling. Um, as to what happens, so we are concerned, yeah. Um, and then what is the current state of the emergency department still? Um, are there still, you know, a lot of patients waiting to be admitted or waiting for beds once they're admitted and long wait times, or is that starting to ease up a little bit? It's easing up a little bit. Uh, we were averaging on any given morning, 70 to 80, what we call patient holds. And I think that number was 50 this morning. So we're starting to see that ease up a little bit. Yeah. One more for me, if that's okay. Um, you talked about how could you not be concerned seeing some of the images. If now that we are starting to see, as you call this cautious optimism decrease, and then those numbers continue to go back up higher, potentially even higher than your peak so far, right. what do you think that would do to your staff emotionally? Well, I think you could you can see what's happening to the staff. I mean, they're exhausted. I think we're at 565 days that we've been at this. So it's going to be a challenge, and we're going to have to do everything we can to support them. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it would be not only physically exhausting, but emotionally frustrating to see the numbers begin to dip and then go up again. Um, and you guys said that there were 18 kids fighting for their lives in the hospital? Well, we have 18 people with COVID in the children's hospital. 15 of those are children. We have a few young adults. Um, that make the total of 18. Thank you all again for being here. Appreciate it.